children who either don't know what to focus on or can't keep a focus once they have it, or the third part, there are really three parts of focusing problems. One is transitions. So who are the kids who have the hardest time with transitions that you often teach? If they're on the spectrum of autism, they, that's part of the disability of they need a lot of prior knowledge <laughs> about what to expect down the line so they, they don't shift mental gears very well. So those would be the three parts we'll talk about with focus, and we're going to talk about that today. Impulse control, these are the kids who've already done it by the time they figure out whether it was a good idea or not. <clears throat> Anticipating consequences, the ability to do self-calming. These are the kids who come in from recess or cafeteria and just cannot take it down so that they can start to focus again. <clears throat> Self-monitoring, I didn't want to make a separate chapter on self-monitoring because that one has to be in all of the chapters. Children who do not self-monitor don't get better at any of this very often. I mean, it's the awareness of where you are and where you need to be. And John Hattie's work would say self-monitoring, if you teach kids to self-monitor, you can make the biggest academic and behavior growth of anything else that you can do. So <clears throat> problem solving are the children who you give an assignment. Um, you say, this is due on Friday. And when do they start it? Friday morning on the way on the bus <laughs> or Thursday night and they say mom I need poster board <laughs> and you're going to some place at midnight and so <clears throat> these are kids who either do that wait till the last minute or they might procrastinate forever because they think the problem looks too big so they decide not to do it they just can't get themselves started have you ever had that happen to you I, <clears throat> I had a hip replacement about 11 weeks ago, and so I thought, I, I'm doing good, huh? <laughs> and I am so happy. And so before that, I thought, well, I'll clean out the uh, attic before this happens to me, and I can't do it for a long time. And I went up there, I opened that door and went, whoa, mm -mm, think I'll wash the windows, and I hate washing windows. But it looked easier to do than tackling that attic because it was just overwhelming. And when things look overwhelming and you don't know where to start, Many times you choose not to. And so even though you're giving them just one assignment or one worksheet to do, some kids that is overwhelming enough to decide not happening. So <clears throat> the problem solving kids would be kids who can't break things, big tasks down into small parts, often have a very poor sense of how long things are going to take. So they think it's gonna take forever so they don't get started, whereas if they quit whining about it and just do it, it would probably take them 20 minutes. Or they think it's going to take 20 minutes and then they don't plan to give themselves enough time to actually do the, the good job. So those, that's kind of the problem solving thing. Planning an organization <clears throat> often are the kids whose lockers, book bags, bedrooms look like somebody lobbed a grenade in there. Their, their writing kind of does stream of consciousness stuff because they also don't organize their ideas well. It's not just stuff, it's also ideas. <clears throat> and memory can break down one of four places. There's what we call encoding, and that is I don't, it doesn't even come in efficiently, so obviously I don't remember it efficiently. That there's working memory, which is the processing of the information, so it might come in just fine, but the processing of compare, contrast, cause, effect, drawing conclusions, making inferences, it goes haywire there. <clears throat> Some children who are good on those two levels and it's the class today and they're like, yep, I get it. And you ask them questions and yep, they have it. But it breaks down in, in storage and retrieval. And that's long-term memory, the storage and retrieval part. <clears throat> 
And this is the way that part of the brain works. We store by what we know that's similar to the new information. But we retrieve by how it's different than the information we already know. So Marzano, familiar to you, says that the most powerful strategy in his work is teaching similarities and differences. And the reason is because that's the way the brain works. <clears throat> so for instance, if I'm a science teacher and I have a substance in my hand here and when I move it, it just kind of wiggles back and forth, you instantly say, oh, that's like... And I go, yes, yeah. so you're filing by what your prior knowledge is, the jello. But I say, okay, the viscosity might be like that, but you can't see through it. So that's a little different, and it's poison. That's a little different. You need to know the difference between jello and this stuff. And so <clears throat> when it's on the, the test, if I've only taught similarities, guess what I might get as an answer? Jello, because it's in the jello folder. But when you teach similarities and differences, they're more able to retrieve exactly what you're talking about. So that's the circle we're going to go around in the rest of today and tomorrow. <clears throat> so let's start with this. This is a case study of Jared and I'm going to have you look at that case study and at your table determine two root causes for Jared's problems. So the coordinators are going to lead this discussion. Timekeepers, three minutes and summarizers are ready to report out and I'll put that back up on the screen for you. Okay, ready? Begin. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I ask a couple of tables to take just one of those lines. I did not give anybody that top one because an F in math and science is not helpful information. It doesn't tell you enough to make any kind of a a reasonable educated guess. So we're just going to let that one just sit there. But taking notes, what would, a what would keep a child from taking notes? And lots of kids who don't know what to focus on, focus on everything which makes nothing important. So what do you write? And these are the kids who are going to scribe everything the teacher is saying, which is a pretty useless kind of note-taking strategy. The other thing I see is teachers who get concerned about children who cannot take notes do something that is enabling but not helpful. And that is put all the notes up on the board. And so then they become copying activities. Copying is not note taking. Copying is copying. Note taking is being able to discern what is notable and to be able to put it in your own words. And if you're not putting it in your own words, it's not note taking. So, you know, we need to do a little flip about, you know, are you doing the work for the kid or are you really helping him learn? Who's learning more? One's an accommodation, one's an intervention. Do you understand the difference? An accommodation is a crutch that gets the kid over some hard spot where you're doing it for him, pretty much. An intervention actually creates growth inside the child and so that you can step away and eventually withdraw the crutch so that they can do for themselves. Big difference and we're going to go into that a little bit tomorrow. So, so but what you are saying is it would be appropriate to use it as an accommodation. You just wouldn't want to keep it there forever. It would mm -hmm. be a short term accommodation. Correct. You're saying you could go ahead and do some note taking for them as long as you don't continue to do it for them forever. And and so I might take note taking on certain aspects and then have them fill in some of it. And then as the year went on, the blanks become bigger and bigger. So we shift who's doing the note taking from me to you. But when you don't shift and you just keep giving them notes, giving them notes, giving them notes. I mean, that's one of the things they wanted to do for my son because he was like all over the place. And she said, I'll just give him my notes and he can do that. And I go, no. 
because you know what's going to happen? He's not going to listen to a stinking word you say because he's going to, if I just have these and I'm good to go. And then he's going to play and do uh, ugly things in your class. And now I'm going to get to go to the principal's office with him. I no, no. <laughs> so the deal we made was, because he was coming home with notes, and I'm saying to him, uh, this is wrong. And he said, nope, that's what she had on the board, because he also doesn't transfer from horizontal to vertical and back and forth very well. So these kids copy some of this and some of that, and it's potpourri kind of stuff. <clears throat> I said, no, that's not right. She had it on the board, that's right. Well, I was a science teacher. And I'm going, please dear God, don't let that be what she did write on the board because that was really wrong. <laughs> and so then that's when we started talking about, okay, how about he takes notes and he hands his notes into you and you trade out your notes then. And that's what he can take home to study from but he has to be taking notes during the class period, which is better, but maybe in a graphic organizer. Students, until they're like juniors in, or seniors in high school, are not very good at multitasking. They think they are, but they are not. And one of the things that requires multitasking is listening and writing at the same time. And so, um, I can't remember who was saying about, were you saying about you use the elbow buddies? Yes. yes. And <clears throat> so here's a good strategy for all children, but essential for kids who have some focusing delays, is you don't talk to them more than they are old, more minutes than they are old. You know that part, right? Hmm. No. You don't talk to them more minutes than they are old, number one because the neurotransmitters can only fire so long. So if you're a kindergarten teacher, how long do you have? And the kindergarten teachers get that because after about five minutes of trying to do circle time, the kids are finished and the little ones just get up and leave. <laughs> With your kids, they just leave mentally. And so uh, Eric Jensen's research would say their age plus or minus two. So if they have a lot of prior knowledge, they're really excited about it, and you are excited about it, you can probably stretch them two minutes beyond their age, which is a long time. If they don't have a lot of prior knowledge, so the, the concepts are really difficult for them, or you are boring as dirt, then you need to take it down two minutes. If it's right before the Halloween party, down two minutes. If it's right before dismissal, down two minutes. So what I've been doing all morning, I have a timer in this remote. And every, how many minutes am I allowed to talk to you? 45. <laughs> <laughs> She's just a baby. <laughs> it's as many minutes as you are old. So I've been setting my timer for 20 minutes. Does that work for you? <laughs> And the reason I've been doing that is because adults top out at 25. I don't care how old you are. 25 is about the max you can go. And so I'm not betting on you guys for 25. I'm going to say at 20. And then what happens is it counts down. And then I've been, see all this, these little notes I have up here? I talked three minutes, you talked one. I talked six minutes, you talked three. I talked six minutes, you talked four. I... I have made 17 transitions before lunch, and I have talked 39% of the time, and you have talked 61% of the time. I wasn't doing so well before break, but I fixed it after lunch. You're supposed to talk 46% of the time. I mean, 64%, right. She also is dyslexic. 64% <laughs> of the time for learners or 65% of the time, 35% for teachers. And so it, it's not like it works every period like that, 
But when you start at the beginning of a unit, you're probably going to do a heavier amount of talking than the children are. But as you're going through the unit and they become more adept with the information, you need to be backing off. And over a period of a week, it needs to come out to be they talk a lot more than you do, like a third, a third, a third two thirds for them, one third for you, kind of. Now, <clears throat> I rarely can hit that I only talk 35% of the time, but I can always hit, now that I know this research, uh, a little less than 50. So would you have learned as much this morning if I had stood up here and just lectured? Chances are not. You might have felt like you did at first, but believe me, by the time you got back to school, it would mostly be gone. Whereas this morning, probably the thing you will remember most is the charts that you did up here. When you were up and moving and talking to other people, that's going to stick a lot better. So, <clears throat> what was I going to, oh, I know where I was going with that. So, if you talk to them a short amount of time and then you say, turn and talk to your partner about what you should have in your notes by now. So the kids can do an oral rehearsal. Then the kids who really don't have a clue what they should be focusing on and putting in their notes have that oral rehearsal with somebody. And hopefully you don't put two kids together who are terrible at note taking because shared ignorance doesn't get them any place. <laughs> and then you're quiet for about a minute and a half and say, all right, now it, check your notes. If that's not what you have, you need to add those things. And, or if it is what you have, but you have a ton of other stuff, highlight those things because that's the most important. And children who cannot focus themselves well enough to do good note taking on their own, all of a sudden are better at it. You get it? Daydreams. They would be daydreaming because... He said he may be feeling overwhelmed and just doesn't know where to start. And so this would be a combination of focusing skills and problem solving skills. And what you will see is often an overlap of more than one executive functioning skill that's taken them down. So you're going to have to pay attention on two, two fronts. And then um, who had steps? You guys did, right? Can't remember steps? Yeah, so looking at memory and whether it's that he can't sequence or he can't store the information, you know, something's going on with his memory. And so that working memory piece or long-term memory piece, some pieces of it. So instantly, I think you guys were saying, what, when I asked you, what do you think's the problem? They didn't have any problem coming up with memory. But when I asked the next question of what part of memory, then that becomes the more diagnostic piece where we start our five whys. Why do you think that's happening? And that's where you really need to go because anybody can say memory. I mean, the teachers can come up with that, but that doesn't solve the problem. <clears throat> and I didn't ask anybody about that hard time stopping one activity and switching to another, but what is that? That's the focusing transition piece that we talked about. Okay, I misspoke. I didn't mean that math and science weren't important and that you wouldn't drill down. Just knowing that they have an F in those two subjects or any two subjects is not that helpful that until you drill down and say, so what's causing them to have that problem in math? And you're saying he doesn't have number sense. And my next question would be to you, what's keeping him from having number sense? And what would you say? Well, what I'd say that if he doesn't Sorry, repeat your question again. If, if we were having this conversation about a given child, do you have a child in your head that doesn't have good number sense? Yeah. Okay. So now we started, he has an F in math. I say, what causes him to have an F, F in math? And you go, doesn't have number sense. And I say, so what keeps him from having number sense? So how old is he? 17. <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> so where are you going underneath that now? Why doesn't he have it? Um, well, trying to stay above the line, I'm going to say... Good girl. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to say yes. He uh, does not have that 
long-term memory and the mm, maybe planning an organization because he hasn't kept those notes. Okay, let's just go with the memory piece. Okay. Because see, if she gives me multiple paths to follow, we could follow any of those. But we're just going to take this one, and if it doesn't go anyplace good, we'll go the other one. So what is it about his math memory? What keeps him from remembering the stuff about number sense? It wasn't connected to something similar or different. Okay, right. so... Mm -hmm. or some version of that he is not one of the things that will keep kids from being good at math and and you hit on the one that is most generally the problem and that is the ability to visualize what the problem's asking if I can't do a mental picture of what that is I will stink at math forever I cannot visualize the patterns I will always be terrible at math. You could give me the algorithm and I could solve problems, but if I don't understand what I'm doing, you give me a real life problem to solve and it's going to crash and burn because that's called pretend math, which our textbooks have been teaching for years. And so now that the, the standards have kind of shift to real math, People are going, whoa, this isn't working so well. But it's because there's not enough concrete um, connection being made. And so they have poor number sense. <clears throat> so how do you fix that? How do you fix that? <laughs> yeah, that's you. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we I can do that. More than one 17-year-old that doesn't have number sense. So, and I have 30. <laughs> So talk at your table quickly. I mean, I have an answer for you, but I want to see what you come up with. What, what could fix any child at any age who has number sense as the issue? What would a teacher look at first to do? Ready? Go. Okay. So I'm going to ask you what kind of things you thought about. And Erica, you have to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you teach visualization of math? And so many times our elementary teachers are skipping that part too early. They're doing it in kindergarten and first grade, but instead of doing what they call CRA math, concrete to representational to abstract. And when teachers do the concrete you know you're counting cookies kind of a thing but they don't say okay make a representation of that just use tally marks so here's two cookies and here's three cookies they're not really cookies they're just marks on a paper but you see that's just a little more abstract than the actual cookies are and then you need to put the numerals over here because they won't connect this to the most abstract if you don't do all three at the same time. And then what you can do is drop the concrete after a while and just do representational and abstract. And finally, you can go just to the abstract. But when you say this child doesn't have number sense, what you're saying is they can't make a visual representation in their head and they can't do it on paper either and they couldn't count it out with real stuff. And when that happens, then you get them at middle school and high school level, and then it all goes to hell in a handbasket. So what does that look like in an algebra class? I can make this whole room break out into a sweat yeah. by just saying a, a train left Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> you go, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> and so when you can't visualize okay if the train left Chicago here and this one did here and what that path would look like you don't even want to start that it's all just abracadabra math with memorizing formulas who, that mean nothing that's why around fourth or fifth grade they start asking kids to come up with the formulas instead of learn the formulas because if you can't visualize it that's impossible so what's a quick way to, you know, a shortcut way to do this, but without having the concrete to representational first, it's not going to happen. So those algebra tiles need to come 
out of those cabinets if you, or buy them if you don't have them already. There has to be some kind of manipulatives. Or if I say, okay, a man's gait is probably two, a woman's gait is probably two thirds that of a man. So if we both start on the right foot, how many steps would it be before we're both on the right foot again and shoulder to shoulder? And so everybody goes, <laughs> but if I say, would you walk with me in, you know, and we just absolutely walk it out, all of a sudden they go, okay, got it. So <clears throat> lots more hands-on, lots more real life, lots more visualization. And <laughs> so that's where that took us. So do you get my yeah. point that I went all the way yeah, around yeah. the table with? <laughs> that it's, if you give not such helpful information like he has an F in any subject, your next question is, Wife, what's causing that F, and then you keep drilling down at least five levels. And if that's not helpful, then you go five more. And it will never solve itself in less than five. I'll show you it tomorrow. Okay. Now, when I'm training coaches to do this five wise deep, one of the things that they go, whoa, I, I'm out of my league here. Because if the teacher gets stuck, you as the coach can't afford to be stuck with him or her. And so what I've done is put together these charts that are sort of diagnostic. And obviously not every possible problem can be on the chart. The charts would be bigger than this room. And so what I've done is take the most common causes that research shows that typically these are the things that trip kids up. And so in the book Causes and Cures, every chapter has one or two of those charts. So there's one on reading, math, writing, and the six executive functioning skills, and one on motivation. The one in motivation is not in here. The, um, that one's on my website, though, and as, as are all the charts. So if you go to my website and you go to downloadables, on the, I think it's the very last thing you can download, it's called root cause charts. You can download all of these charts, which I've noticed in the book, I'm not real happy with the charts in the book because I think they're hard to read. <laughs> and so it helps when you have bigger, clearer print. And lots of the coaches that I train would have laminated those charts and just keep them in front of them and constantly go, okay, what's going on with this kid? It could be this, it could be this, it could be this. So <clears throat> let's just talk about getting focused, staying focused, shifting. I want to figure out how good your focus is. I'm going to show you a video clip. And during this clip, I want you to focus on the team with the white shirts on. And if you've seen this clip before, mm. so <clears throat> now you see these kids? You have a black shirt team and a white shirt team and you are to focus on who? White. And every time a white shirt team passes to another white shirt team member, <coughs> you are to count that as one pass. Now a pass might be just a straight, I shoot it to you, or I could lob it to you, or I could bounce it to you, it doesn't make any difference. A pass from one person to the other counts as a pass. And it's a pretty quick clip, so really concentrate. Who are you concentrating on? Okay. Okay, so tell your table members how many passes you saw. How many people saw something kind of strange? How many people saw or did not see a big black gorilla? 
If you did not see a black gorilla, put your hand up. Come on, a lot of us didn't. Now, when they were playing this game, there was a big black gorilla that walked right through the game. And a whole bunch of people in this room didn't see it. I would say at least half of you, probably. The first time I saw this, I did not see the black gorilla. The lady next to me didn't see the black gorilla. And the second time we played it, she still didn't see the black gorilla. Because <laughs> she was focusing on the passing. So that's one of the things that happens when you are really focused. You can actually blot out distracting information. And some kids haven't learned how to, you know, get rid of in, uh, inhibit block uh, interrupters. So <clears throat> I'm going to have you do an activity with your six o'clock partner this time. So the passage that is not only on the screen but also in your packet I want you to read that. What page is that on? Thank you. On page eight, it's at the t in the top frame. And I want you to read that and write down in the margin just two or three of the most critical pieces of information there. Do that before you meet your partner. Okay, once you have your key thoughts, when you meet with your partner, decide, see if your two or three most important ideas match. And then stay with your partner because there are two more parts to this activity. Ready, go. Okay. Now, there's a fairly decent chance that your answers didn't match. Because when you read a personal narrative like this, there is no main idea. And so whatever you thought was the main idea was the main idea. Simple as that. Now, part of that was also a problem of instruction. So if I am a weak teacher, which I was role playing the first time, I just say, read it and pick out the main idea. Now, watch this change when I become a better teacher and I focus you before you read. You are a burglar and you are going to rob this house and I want you to pick out two or three pieces of critical information for yourself. Ready? Go. Okay, I bet you had a pretty easy time picking it out that time. You know, what were some of the things you picked out? That would be an important piece of information. You know when nobody's generally there and so you're kind of sitting back so nobody's going to see you. That, I'm sorry, what did you say? Yeah, so that's also hiding you. Did you know where all the good stuff was? <laughs> yeah, and so all of those pieces, so it kind of jumped right out of you. You didn't have any hard time coming to, oh yeah, that's important. Now, I'm going to change your focus and it's going to change the answers. This time, you're not a burglar. You are the real estate agent and you are going to sell this house. Now pick out what's most important. Ready? Start. Okay, so what did you pick out this time? And this time it was important for a different reason, not because it was hiding things, but because there was space and it was beautiful. What else? Mm -hmm. Okay, the painting wasn't important before, now it is. Fireplace and new stone siding. That's right. And probably that musty basement probably is a, played a, a part in it too. So do you understand that whatever the teacher thinks is important, to focus on will change the right answers. Now, if the kids don't know what you're focusing on, 
how are they supposed to guess that these are the right answers and these are not? The text did not change, but the answers did. So thank your partner, go back to your seat. How do you establish a clear purpose for kids? Probably part of your, uh, when people do walkthroughs and evaluations for teachers, you are being asked to make sure that you tell the kids what your goals and objectives are for the lesson at the beginning of that lesson. Now, I would change that to your promises, but whatever. You need to say, by the end of this lesson, you will understand more about addition and subtraction and how they work together than when you came in here today. Or by the end of this lesson, you will understand why the war that we're studying now is much like the war that we studied you know, at the beginning of the year and how that compares and contrasts, whatever it is. So, and why it's important. I was in one high school and I usually ask five kids in the room, what are you supposed to learn by the end of this lesson? And of course, if they're high school kids, they go, I don't know. <laughs> and you, so my next question is, if you did know, what would you say? And you would be amazed at how many times they will answer me. And so this kid said, we're learning about imperialism. It says right up on that board. And all she had written is the topic, which is not really an objective, but it's, it's close enough. So I said, okay. So my next question, though, is more important, and that is, why would you care about imperialism? And he goes, lady, I don't care. I just have to get a B in this class or I'm going to be off the team. <laughs> that should not be the answer that I get. And if I get that from one child but the other four can answer, I know it's not the teacher that's not focused. It's the kids. But when I get five out of five, guess what? That's the teacher. So that would be critical. Sometimes if you give them graphic organizers, that would be the second way that really helps kids focus. And so in one of my classes, this is kind of the graphic organizer that I started with for a child who just could not seem to get the gist of what we were doing. I would write in the main idea and say, this is what we're studying today. Now, I'm gonna keep checking with you and I wanna make sure you have three important details about how we taste things and tell me something about it, and that's gonna be how we're gonna check to see if you're with me. And then at the end, we're gonna take those three things and we're gonna put them all together and make a summary. And so that would kind of step them up. How many of you have ever taught Cornell note-taking? It is amazing. And, oh, wait a minute. For younger kids, I started out this way, just using a graphic organizer of like a web where you put, you know, the idea, main idea is in the center and then you say, now we're gonna talk about the roots, blah, 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 blah. Now we're gonna talk about what the roots do. And I had the kids always draw a picture because visualization in reading is as important as visualization in math. If you can't visualize what's going on, your comprehension stinks every time. I used to ask the kids when I was a language arts teacher, I said, so what is the movie that's playing in your head? And they go, it's not a movie, it's a book. And you go, no, no, movie in head. <laughs> Has to be a movie in there. Or if you can't see what, the, you know, what each character is doing, then you're going to lose pieces. So, you know, STEM, and then we'd say, okay, or come on, go backwards. First, next, last, I mean, it could be that kind of, whatever graphic suits whatever you're teaching, and the more the graphic includes pictures that the kids are drawing, and you need to say to the kids, it's not about art, it's just about a symbol or a picture that will remind you of this concept, and the better off you are. So, big kid model, which I, th I didn't think I started this until about fourth grade. And I would have the kids fold their paper into three columns. And the first day, I would say to them, okay, here are the things we're going to talk about today. Igneous rock, sedimentary, and metamorphic. I want you to write those down on your paper and skip five spaces. 
So that gave them a place to put the details over here. So I'm also at the same time teaching a comprehension skill, yes, no? Main idea details. And so I would talk about igneous rocks and then I would say, turn to your partner, tell them the most important things I said about igneous rock, and then they would put down, okay, this, this, and this. And then we do, same thing with sedimentary, same thing with metamorphic. The next day, so that's Monday. The next day, we'd start class by having them fold their paper over so they couldn't see the details, but they could see the main ideas. And they would practice with a partner, what do you remember that you wrote as details under those three categories? And between the two of them, they would, why would I have them do that with a partner and just not alone? We're making another memory path. And so not just visual, but also auditory. And then they could open it up and see if they were right or not. Then on Tuesday, I had them create a visual that would go with it. So igneous rock. If you know that that's made from molten material that hardens, then you would probably draw what as your picture? 100% of the time they drew, drew a, a volcano. Or if they're doing it on an iPad, which you said your kids often had, it might be downloading a picture that they wanted. And then sedimentary, if that is the sediment that settles through water and hardens, what do you think they're going to draw? Probably the picture of ocean or water, you know, a river, anything. Just two lines that go, Psht, that's all they would have to draw. Metamorphic is a little trickier because metamorphic is rock that is created from heat and pressure. What would you draw? that would be the symbol for heat and pressure? Tell the person next to you. An anvil? And so, and a lot of the kids would do an iron, or, yeah, because I wouldn't have thought of an iron, but they did. I just would do wavy lines and then two arrows coming in, which I don't know, yeah, that's kind of what I would have done. It doesn't have to be a picture picture. It can be symbols. And so now, now we're to Wednesday, right? Because these are their notes so far. On Wednesday, they fold the paper the other way and just look at the pictures. And what do I want them to do? What does that picture stand for? What's the key idea? And what are the things you remember about it? So now it's a lot heavier load as far as memory systems go, just triggered by a visual. And then on and then that day we would write a summary and if you say to the kids write a summary in this little space right here they will squeeze all the words they have up here into that little space unless you say you can only use x number of words then that forces a summary because they, there's no way they can make it make sense if you give them a limit with words and sometimes i'd make it a math problem and they hated that I'd say, you have 250 to spend, and each word is a nickel. That's all you have. And so they're going, <laughs> so that's a good thing. Now, on Thursday, they were allowed to use this sheet for an open note quiz. Tell the person next to you, why would you give an open note quiz? It's a guaranteed A. Not necessarily, right? <laughs> Okay, let's see what you came up with. Lisa, what were you saying over there? It's a way to check and make sure that their notes are right, they were accurate in their information. Yes, and it kind of is that accountability piece of knowing that on Thursday you can take this open note quiz, kind of boost them into, okay, maybe I better take good notes. And it's also a way to study because if I now have to look at questions, and match the information to it. It becomes a little more complex as well. And then on Friday was the, the real quiz, which, you know, you have to put your note away. Do you understand what I'm doing with this? I am teaching them to study. My kids would have notes, and I'd say, and they'd say, we got to have a test in science tomorrow. I'd say, where's your note? In my locker. 
<laughs> you go, well, that's a good place for it. And they just didn't get it that notes are things you use to study. They thought they used their notes because the teacher was going to get after them if they didn't take notes. And there was no purpose behind it. So when you show them a study method like this, which is basically what this is, is modeling how do you study. And medical and law students in many universities are required to use Cornell note-taking system. <laughs> and so you know it has to be powerful because it's, you know, it's very rigorous. So <clears throat> that's how to get them to focus. Now staying focused is a different deal, right? And so here's what we know from the research from Michael Gurian. Just go ahead and read that. Does that surprise you? You know that almost intuitively just from watching the guys. Here's what an MRI shows. This is a male's brain when he's bored witless. You see this part of the brain? That's the part that keeps you alive. <laughs> this is the only it, a little bitty fire that's happening other than just zone. With a girl, you never see the lack of activity kind of all over the brain because they're in, they do internal talk almost programmed into them. Now, not necessarily about what you're wanting them to pay attention to, <laughs> but it's, there's some kind of talk going on all the time. So when we're talking about um, paying attention and sustaining focus, the girls appreciate time to move and talk. The boys have to have it, have to have it. And so one of the things you could be doing is too much information at once. And when you do that, you're messing with the working, part, working memory part of the brain. Also, the working period could be too long without some kind of a mental break. Now, here's what I'm talking about. You see that kind of roller coaster looking thing? When you're doing a lesson, what do you think happens here at the beginning of a lesson? Should, should happen. What should the teacher be doing? Telling them what to focus on, stating the objectives or doing the prediction, whatever way you have of making them know, here's where we're going. Then you have how many minutes until you have to stop doing just lecture, passive. And then, or plus or minus two, remember. And then they go into downtime. Neurologists call it downtime. I don't like downtime as a a term so much because I think of downtime as a break. No, no, it's just the opposite of the break. It's active processing. So instead of passive, you go active. And then what do you think happens here? Should happen. Summary. Right, so it could be the exit ticket or the summary. So what I've been doing all day, what did I say, 17 times this morning, and six times so far this afternoon, is here's where we're going. I talk, you talk, or you do some kind of downtime processing thing. And then I say, okay, wind it up. Now this is what we're going to do next. And so in any given class period, you could repeat this cycle multiple times, or it could just be one cycle. So here's your next question, just at your table. So timekeepers, two minutes. How long do you think that downtime or processing time can last? Ready? Go. Okay. So, you know how long this is. How long is this? That's the question that you were asked. What was your guess? Just popcorn it out, whatever you think. How many people thought it was less than five minutes? More than five minutes. And some of you aren't thinking at all? Come on. <laughs> okay, double. Now, no matter what you answered, it could be right. Because there isn't a specific time for downtime. It's as long as the kids either need. Now, it has to be at least 2.5 minutes. 
because the neurotransmitters in your brain have to have about that amount of time to regenerate enough energy to listen again. And so you'd be unwise to let it be less than 2.5. Most of the time I was I've been giving you three, four, five, six minutes, that kind of stuff. Some activities more than others. But let me just pretend I am, a, I'll be an art teacher. And I say to the kids, okay, today we're going to do two-point perspective, which we talked about yesterday. Now, remember what that was, blah, 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 blah. And I go over the assignment criteria of this is what we're going to do today. You're going to actually work on a project. And I get them all set up. That might take five or six minutes. And then this time is how long they have to work on their picture. Now, do you understand that some kids might stay involved for an hour if I would give it to them, and other kids would be about five minutes and then we're off. So that's why teachers have to be walking around the room and seeing where kids are, and if you're all of a sudden off task, then I have to kind of do a quick little, okay, remember what we're doing, blah, 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 and get you started again. So... It can be whatever amount of time the kids need. What kind of activities are appropriate for downtime or processing time? What might that look like? Independent, or it could be partner work or small group work, anything they're doing. It could be reading something. So one time I gave you a passage to read, did I not? Most of the time I've given you things to talk about. It could be that you're drawing something. It could be that you are working at a chart. I, it could be problems that you are trying to solve. Anything that puts the kids in the driver's seat from the learning perspective is appropriate then. So do you understand why I can walk through a building and not spend very many t minutes in each teacher's room and instantly tell whether they are research-based instructors or not? All I have to do is time them. If you are going 20 minutes and the kids aren't 20, you're off. You're off. Now, how much planning time would that take from a teacher to shift from what they're doing to that? Nothing. It's an awareness of the fact that that's the way the brain works best. So if you can just share that with the people back at the ranch, most of them would probably fix it. Now they might need to buy themselves one of these little jobbies. This not only moves my PowerPoint forward, but it has a timer in here. So right now I've been talking exactly five minutes. What it will do when it gets down to five minutes left, because I set it for 20, remember I told you that's about what I, I never will go longer than 20 minutes. When it gets to five minutes, it buzzes in my hand like a cell phone on vibrate wood. And then it buzzes again at two minutes, and then it buzzes as it goes off. It really ought to do the <laughs> and then do that. And so it gives me three warnings that you have talked too long. Wind it up. And I think they're $69 on Amazon, and it's a Logitech. I think this would be a good Christmas present for a lot of faculty members because we get excited about what we're talking about, but the kids not so much. So it, it just helps you with the pacing of your lesson. So watch this part about not enough variety in the approach because that would be another thing that would mess with kids' focus. This is an MRI of a brain reading. You see this part? This is what the neurotransmitters are firing back there. When you go to listening, then it fires here and here, kind of close to your ears, and that's a new, while, while this is recovering, the reading part is recovering, then their listening is taking over. Then when you're thinking or writing about words, then it's kind of direct center there, and it's a new part of your brain. Watch what happens when I ask you to talk to each other. Do you understand why the memory system is so much stronger? Look how many more connections are being made, and you're just resting one part and moving to another. Mm-hmm. That is kind of the bottom line of all of this. 
that when we don't do the right things as instructors, we cause more problems for the kids than they're able to handle. So the more serious the problem of can't sustain focus is, the more that if we do not do these instructor things, we are actually contributing to the problem instead of supporting the problem. So it's kind of both things, that when you violate it, you're, you're creating problems you don't need. And the more you do these things, then it, the more it supports the kids. So here, cannot break tasks down. Is that an instructor can't break the task down or the kid can't break the task down? That is exactly what we're talking about. There would be some children who take that long-term assignment and they're good to go because they have the coping skills to be able to do that. And then there are some kids in your class that absolutely that makes them go, I'm done, here I am. And unless you help them initially. Now, here's the difference between what you were talking about. I think it, we were talking about the accommodation intervention thing. The accommodation would be what you described of, I'm going to break this down for you. Just work till here, and then we'll take a little break, which is perfect. And when the kids can't do that for themselves, the adult needs to model, this is the way we break things down. Now, here's the part that goes a little south, is if we do that for them forever, they never learn to do it for themselves. So the, here's how you can flip that to an intervention. If you say to him, how far do you think you can get in five minutes? Let's mark it. Okay, we'll set the timer. Go ahead and work just till then, and we'll see if you were right on your estimate. So you see what you're doing is after you've modeled it a couple of times, you're kind of turning pieces over to them. Result is still the same. You're breaking it down into pieces, but they're taking the lead instead of you. And so that's the shift that needs to happen. But it's all about, there was a, a principal that was sitting about where you are, and he was going, when I was doing this coaching and they were doing the analysis, and he came to the same kind of conclusion you did, he said, what if you find out that the problem is the teacher? <laughs> it's always us. That's not an indictment. That's not a blame. That would be below the line. If it is something that can be fixed, and we don't see how to fix it, we have to own that. That doesn't mean we're a bad teacher, it just means we haven't seen it through that lens so far, and the more you can expand teachers' ability to diagnose, the better they are at seeing it. And I don't, I've been a teacher for 52 years, hello, and I am still struggling with learning all this stuff. So, n well, not that, you know, I'm the model exactly, but I don't care how long you're in this business, and I spend hours and hours and hours daily looking at research. Uh, I don't have a life. <laughs> and I don't know all the answers, so how do you, if you're a second year teacher, expect to know all this stuff? But when you work in a team, there are things that other people know that you may not and they can give you these insights into what part of your instruction needs to change if you want a new result. And isn't that what Einstein said? If you're expecting a new result, you have to not keep doing what you used to do because you're not going to get anything different than what you used to get. And so that's the whole thing about this conference is you're seeing a new way to look through a lens at kids' problems so that you can help more. You're going to come up with root causes for the next case study with your six o'clock partner this time as opposed to your table partners. And so this is William. You can read through the case. Okay. So we have William, who's just doing this sit and stare thing and not getting on with the work. So, um, Stacy, were you the one that was going to do that one? Oh, no, it was Nicole. Nicole. Um, we talked about how he may not know what he's expected to do. He doesn't know what the end goal is. So, 
instead of being able to get started, he's stuck. And, and he needs to know what the expectation is before he can get started. Yeah. So kids who can't get started usually are here or here. They can't visualize that goal or they can visualize what they're supposed to do, but they can't figure out how they're going to get themselves from where they are to where they need to be. And so you'll find lots of possibilities right here. Okay, and who had the procrastinates until the last minute? I think, did you guys have that? Okay, who knows procrastinates until the last minute? Who did you have, you have a thought, Lisa? And again, I'm just going back to my son who very much fits these. Um, that's, he's not recognizing that he's stressed out and, and he's, he's getting anxiety, so he's not able to cope with it. And he's also um, needing strategies to self-soothe when he's getting anxious. So that would definitely, I mean, stress is going to be one of them. No sense of urgency and it could be any of these things would also be part of it. But if the kids are stressed, it's almost like that will be the universal address that first because you, you can't even talk to them if they're really heavily stressed. And then quits when it gets hard. So if every time you have a hard time, you stop. And how many of you have kids who, this is too hard, I'm finished. And people who are employers are all are saying that that is just ubiquitous. It is awful that kids go, I don't know what to do. So instead of asking or having some kind of a backup plan, they just stop. And when we talk about impulsiveness to, uh, tomorrow, that's often a companion piece to this of, you know, if I just look helplessness, helpless enough, Somebody will save me. And the payoff is you don't have to work. And so we have to be real cognizant of the fact of when kids actually legitimately need support and help and modeling. And when you go, okay, just try it first and then we'll see where you need help. But no, I'm not going to start this for you every time. So, and so that self-monitoring piece is, is a big issue as well. Okay, say thank you to your partner, return to your place. So in problem solving, I absolutely love that cartoon. I think that is so funny. <laughs> that if I can't visualize, then I can't create a plan because I don't know where I'm going. You know, if, any, if you don't know where you're going, any road will do, so just pick something. And no sense of urge urgency will slow you down or make you miss deadlines all over the place. Backup plan, self plan. So those are the five areas where kids who po plan poorly need interventions. And <clears throat> when we're talking visualizing the end result, they need to be able to break the end result down into its component pieces. This is where things like anxiety, which is what you were saying, play into, I don't know where to start, and it's making me really stress out. And so getting some self-calming kind of procedures might be one of the first ones, but something that will also relieve the stress is breaking this task into visualized parts. So I have a first grade rubric. Have you ever used weighted rubrics? I think they're awesome. So in, here's what I usually, when I'm doing rubric training, I say to the teachers, okay, if you could only pick four things to work on as you're teaching, let's say, writing this month, what would be the four things? And instantly the teachers will say, well, there are lots more than four things. And I go, no, listen, only you get four. Which four are you going to focus on? You can teach more than that, but four things are going to really count big. Because if you focus on everything, you focus on nothing. And so these teachers said, okay, whatever they write has to actually tell a story. And it has to be clear enough that I can tell what story they're talking about. And 
their spelling has to be close enough that they can read it back to me. And the spacing has to be that because otherwise that's everything's scrunched together and you can't tell what word it is. So second grade teachers wouldn't have those four things because by then the spacing is getting, well, some second grade teachers, with, with some kids you'd always need it. But this would, this for this, I think this was a two and a half week period, that was their rubric. Now they can change something on the rubric. When the spacing looks good, you can replace it with something. Notice that four points. This is really good, pretty good, kind of average. Oops, you got some right, but it, this is not, not going well. And notice that there's a multiplier over here. Do you know what the multiplier is for? It's to tell the kids which parts are the most important. So if you can't do all four, do the one that has the biggest value. So if I score four on it's telling a story, how many points do I get over here? And if I score three here, I get 24. So you understand how that is? So actually, if you multiply all the fours out, it'll come out to be 100 points. Now, it won't equate to A, B, C, because it, it just doesn't. But it tells the kids, OK, if you can't spell very well, or you can't space well, very well, that's not the most important thing here. The most important thing is clear and story. That makes sense to me. When you look at a fifth grade rubric, and sometimes depending upon who I'm talking to, that could become an eighth grade rubric because same deal. You see how they've come up with their four things and that the sequence of ideas scores highest, clear pictures second. Notice that four is the conventions of writing, the spelling, grammar, punctuation, capitalization. Most teachers spend far more time on the conventions of writing than they do teaching real writing. And you think, what is up with that? If I had to take a choice between kids who could put their thoughts on paper and kids who could punctuate and edit well, I'd go for thoughts on paper every time. And so this also calibrates for the teachers, where should you put most of your time? on the important elements of writing. And so once the kids have that, they now have a clear idea of what good looks like. Now here's the way it kind of plays out. I was in Ontario and there were a group of five social studies teachers. And what they noticed is, uh, one of the parents brought this to their attention. Uh, this parent had twin boys. And they worked on the project together, their, their essay, and they handed them in to two different teachers. One got an A and one got a D. It was the exact same paper. And the parents going, really? What's up with that? I mean, she wasn't very happy about the fact that the kids had written one paper and handed it in like that, but that it really brought the problem to light. Do you not know that you could have two teachers in your school right across the hall from one another teaching the exact same thing and scoring just that off from one another? And each teacher thought they had a clear rubric in their own mind, but it was no match. Now, if the kids, if the teachers don't know what quality looks like, how are the kids supposed to know? So what we decided to do was create their rubric, their weighted rubric again. And then I pulled real kids' papers and had them score it independently. And we agreed they, they didn't particularly get along real well, so this made a little ouchy. And when you mess with teachers' grading system, it gets ouchier. <laughs> and so we made an agreement that nobody would leave the school until we came to consensus on three papers. Well, I was not happy with the group because I had to work till eight o'clock that night. <laughs> yeah, they were just like, nope, it's not gonna be, you're being too rough, you're being too easy. That's the way it was gonna be. And so we go, okay, should I order dinner? <laughs> and so they finally came to consensus about an A and a B and a C paper. 
Then the next day the agreement was, we'll give the A paper to all the kids and give them the rubric that we came up with and see how they score it. And you know what happened? The same thing that the teachers went through. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. And when they argued it out, they came a little closer faster than the teachers did. And then the teachers said, this is the way we vetted it last night. And so do you understand why this paper is an A? And the kids are going, okay, got it. Tomorrow we're going to give you another paper that's not quite as good, and we're going to have you do this again. And so they gave them the B paper, and the kids had to say what parts of it made it B, not A, because there were elements that were just like A, but there were other elements that were a little weaker. And the kids had a pretty easy time of, uh, not real easy, but I mean, it took them most of the period to do it. But all of a sudden they're going, oh, okay, got it. The third day we gave them a C paper and said, you not only need to score this, but you need to write a letter to the kid who wrote this paper telling them how to get an A. Now, and they said to me, after I checked back with them a couple months later, we have never gotten such consistently good writing across the board than we have this year. And what was the difference? Not the kids, because those boys were all the same boys. It was the clarity with which the teachers laid out the expectations. And so there needs to be not only clarity across your grade level, in different content areas, because that's where it kind of goes to hell in a handbasket. The English teachers say this, and the social studies go, yeah, close enough for government work. And we're just, you know, it's something like if you do bullet points and you go, no. The English department cannot be the only people teaching writing. They don't have nearly enough time to teach good writing. It has to be across the board. If you teach me to read, I won't necessarily be a good writer. If you teach me to write, my reading will improve. <coughs> and so that will affect everything you do. So my suggestion to you is not only align horizontally, but also align vertically. Do you see the rubric from the grade level before you and after you? And how do you fit in that sequence? And when the alignment is all off, the kids become extremely confused and it makes them really at risk for doing high quality work. So talk at your table for a moment about how well do you think your own teachers are aligned in terms of their expectations for just do writing. Ready? Go. Okay. So let's say that you've done that. You have a clear rubric or a checklist, whatever it is, depending upon the task. And the kid knows exactly what good looks like. Sometimes in my, on my bulletin board, I would have the rubric posted and then I'd have anchor papers that would say, that would, you know, I'd have string going, see here, see here, see here, so that they could see. Or if I were um, having them do a project of some kind. I would have somebody's project from last year that wasn't the same prompt as this year because I don't want them just copying somebody else's stuff. That this is what makes a good project and if those pieces aren't in place then yours isn't so good. So they could use that and they could always see that. Once they can visualize that then they have to be able to visualize how do I get myself to that because if the expectation is too high, then the kids go, not going there. And so the first thing you do with kids who struggle with that would be to list, well, what are the steps that it would take to get you from here to there? And a lot of times they can't even tell you the steps. So you might have to model that a couple of times. And then I'm going to show you a chart that not only has the steps, but I ask them to sequence the steps. So now, post-it notes weren't embedded when the earth was cooling and I was doing this, but now I would have them do post-it notes and say, all right, now put those post-it notes in order according to how you're going to proceed.
because sometimes there is a sequence of do this first and then, but even if there isn't a sequence, they need to have a sequence in their head about what they're going to do first, second, and third. Because some kids jump from this to that to the something else, the way I clean house. My husband just goes, really, Margaret? When you clean, the whole house is in a total uproar. By the end of the night, it's all back together, but it makes me crazy. Can't you just do one room at a time? and go, hmm. <laughs> so <clears throat> maybe I ought to use a chart. <laughs> and then... Make sure that they see that there are times for breaks and fun. Because if it looks like this is going to take me forever, I'm not going to start it. There's going to be no fun in here. So here's what would be on the post-it note, which you can't totally see, right? Uh, and what order would it be? And then assign days or assign times to it. And then, of course, the awareness of deadlines helps kids feel that sense of urgency. But since so many kids can't judge, I say you have three minutes to do this, and some kids go, Shh, and they're finished in 30 seconds, and it's all baloney. And other kids think, three minutes, pff, I can rest for the first two. And then they, so that sense of time, that's why that timer with the red stuff disappearing is so helpful. Kids really stink at estimating how long things are going to take. So they need lots and lots of practice on estimating times. Both of my kids had the same third grade teacher and I just adored this woman. She would have the kids put down what time they started every single assignment and then their ending time and figure out how long it took them. And the kid in third grade they thought that was a game. And she said, I never had to teach time or lapse time because they just got it all by their itty bitty because they had so much experience with it. So this is what the organization chart looks like when it's all finished for some kids. That, okay, this step, this brainstorming interesting topics, we're going to start with that because if you don't have a topic, there's no sense finding articles. How long do you think that's going to take? And this particular boy said, I think about three minutes. Well, yeah, right. That wasn't even close. But what we do is just write down three minutes and put a stopwatch on the table and say, okay, get started with that. And when you're finished, see how long it actually took. And he's going, ooh, that took a lot longer than I thought. With the understanding that if it's the first time you've ever done it, it's always going to take longer than it's ever going to take you again once you've got the drift of, of how this goes but at least they get closer and closer at matching their estimated time with actual time. And so, and then he had a, a habit of not having his stuff with him all the time. So we would also fill out for him, now what are you going to need to take with you when you do this? And so that was his planning chart. And then he would keep track of it as he went through. So that self-monitoring piece is as important as doing this chart. So, <clears throat> at your table, well, and a backup plan, the mental rehearsal of what will happen if you don't have a pencil? What will happen if you don't know, you, you know the first two steps and you forget the third one? And in my room, I had a sign that said, three then me. Because I did not want them to do the teacher, teacher thing all the time. And I'm saying, who else could you ask if I am busy with a group? And so they were to ask three other people. Now, when I went to school, the sisters called that cheating. <laughs> but now we're calling it use your resources well. So <clears throat> what will you do if you get stuck? Some children get scared about asking other people for help. They don't know how to approach another person. And so that would be a tier two or a tier three strategy where you practice and rehearse. Okay, pretend this happened and how would you approach me? What would you say? What if I said, I don't have time right now? What would you do? And so they always have a backup plan and that might be something that needs to be practiced with some kids. Most kids won't need that, but a lot of them will. So here's your table talk, timekeepers. You have four minutes, and the coordinator is going to 
start this one. Analyzers, your part is to say what would be some possible barriers that these teachers might mention. So your talk, you have a choice here. You can talk about a science teacher, a social studies teacher, or a music teacher. It doesn't, your choice. How would those teachers apply teaching and modeling these, these uh, problem-solving strategies within their classroom when you know darn well they're going to say, I have too much to cover, I can't be responsible for this. You ready? Four minutes, go. I'll tell you the other reason you need one of these timers is as a teacher, it seems like it's four minutes when it's only been two. Because you're going, come on, come on, come on. You know, we have to get this stuff covered. But the truth of the matter is, if you say they need time to talk and you've gauged it as four minutes, you need to be able to make sure they really have that amount of time. So as um, analyzers, what kind of problems did you anticipate you were going to hear from the content teachers or the fine arts teachers? when you say, you need to actually model and teach kids to problem solve like this. What are a couple of things? We only see them two times a week. Yes, As all the fine arts teachers are probably going to say something like that of limited amount of time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in very big groups. Legitimate? Yep. Should they still be doing it? They should. So you're going to have to figure out a balance between how much of this is going to fall on their plates and how they're reinforcing as opposed to actually teaching the kids to do this, but just saying, okay, show me your plan. How are you doing this? The more teachers teach for transfer, you understand what I'm saying when I, I teach that? So I can teach kids to take notes with Cornell Notes. Let's just say I'm a language arts teacher. And then they go into science class, and guess what? They act like I've never sent the word note before in my life. And so if the science teacher is not saying to them, when you learn this in language arts, I want you to apply it in here. I don't have to teach you how to do it. I just need to ask you to do it and then troubleshoot. See, that makes that balance thing happen. So you need to decide who's going to be the initial teacher of this, and who's going to be the follow-upper? <laughs> and that needs to be kind of across the board. So did you think of another issue that's going to stand in their way? Oh, I hate that one. <laughs> it's not my job. So going totally below the line. <laughs> and so how do you bring them above the line, Angel? <laughs> so if, yes, so if you're saying you're not having any problems with kids following through, and you know that's a big fat lie if they say no. I mean, if they say no, I guess it's no, but they, they're not gonna say that and say, okay, this is a way to move them from, because you're already spending a lot of time on kids who are not complying or not able to comply. So it's not like it's gonna take you more time. It's just gonna be a more efficient use of time when you act as a team to intervene and apply these interventions across the board. Did you guys come up with a different one? Or over here? Nope. Okay, so how are you going to introduce this to the, those three departments and say, okay, this is what you need to do? And if you can get a little consistency from teacher to teacher instead of everybody doing their own deal, if you follow a kid around and they're in a departmentalized setting, it's like working for seven different bosses every day and every boss has a different set of rules. Very, very hard to handle for kids who are already struggling with just being in middle school or in high school. And many of you are probably trying to help an inclusion teacher, you know, a partner teacher who doesn't have the same training as you and they're going, oh, I can't do this for every kid. And you go, you don't have to do it for every kid. Do it for the whole class. And then it's called a universal intervention. <laughs> and you don't have any kids who don't need that kind of support. 
just by virtue, you saw what the brain development was. Every child is struggling with some of those pieces some of the time. So that might help. Okay, you ready to shift gears to the last topic, and that's organization. So take a look at Nina's case study. You meet with your 12 o'clock partner, and here's Nina, and find out for those three things what you think the root cause is. And you know now to use the charts, yes? yes. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. So that things don't end up being where they ought to be, what is causing that problem? Who, who was it? Was that you guys? No, 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 it was... Um, you said it was due to, uh, she has poor sorting and classifying skills. And that is a huge one for kids. So if you have kids who can't make it, draw an analogy, first thing I say to the teachers is, so what's the skill that comes right under that? And I go, and you go, how about metaphors and similes? That's easier than analogies. That's a step up. But what if they can't do metaphors and similes? What's the one under that? And you go, well, maybe they can't classify things. You know, they look at a bunch of stuff and they can't see the similarities. Well, what if they can't classify? Then you go under that, and that is sorting and organizing. And what if you can't do that? Then you go back to where the kindergarten teachers start, and you go, what are the attributes that this has and this has? And just describing attributes. So if you don't know the sequence of how that filters down, then it's really hard for a teacher to figure out, well, what's the missing skill and where do I start? I know there's a company called Battelle for Kids. Are you familiar with that? And they have, for the um, common course standards, progression charts, I think is what they call them, that says if this, you know, look behind, 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 behind to see exactly where this goes off the rails and plug those holes that are way down here or you're never going to get them way up there. And so that's helpful. But with some things, you, you know, Battelle won't help you much. Um, there's another book called um, Yardsticks that helps calibrate your expectations. And what uh, the, the author of that is named Chip Wood, who obviously has a mother with a sense of humor, right? <laughs> and so uh, what he does is say, three-year-olds, logical explanation and maturity, you could expect, expect this physically, socially, emotionally, academically. And then he goes four, five, six, all the way to 16, which is kind of a good way to say, okay, what would be the prerequisite skills or am I expecting too much of this age child because if you're expecting second graders to sit for 30 minutes, get over it, not gonna happen. So <clears throat> that might help. So uh, sorting and organizing here. N Nina is jumping to one thing to another without finishing. And that kind of went back to something that I, were we talking about kids who jump from this to that to the other thing? And writing a paper that are jumbled messes. Who has an idea of what would cause that? And so a lot of times some kind of a graphic organizer that helps them organize their thoughts will, I mean, graphic organizer is gonna, go, gonna be a go-to for any kids with organization problems. They have to be able to visualize where the big picture is in a minimum number of words, and then they can fill it out from there. So thank your partner and go back to your seats. <laughs> so this one kind of looks similar to the focusing skill chart of can't apply strategies and therefore doesn't meet deadlines, can't get their space and stuff organized, can't organize ideas, and then doesn't Day organized, you know, you can, how many times have you reorganized their stuff in their folders? And then the next day you go, really? <laughs> and so not transferring skills from one setting to the next or visualization, you know, uh, doesn't reflect, which would be the self-monitor piece, which is a huge piece about staying organized. And then the procrastination thing. 
And a lot of times that paralysis is anxiety of, I don't know where to start, so I'm not going to start anywhere. This is too big of a mess. And so if we look at the sorting and classifying and can't remember patterns, uh, that's what we're going to do now. So what I'm going to ask you to do is kind of clear a space in the center of your table. Yeah, good luck on that. Huh? <laughs> and once you have that, I want you to do this. I want you to put 10 items, dig through your pockets and your purse, and put 10 items in the middle of the table. The team. So 10 things only in the middle of the table, some contributions from everybody. Okay. Now, here's what, does everybody have 10? Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to sort those 10 things into like three categories. You can do four if you like. And put them in categories because another table is going to have to guess what your categories are. So you'll need to, to name each pile. Okay, once you have your categories, you are going to leave one person to sit at the table who's not allowed to tell how it was sorted. And another table of people are going to visit your table and try to guess the three categories. And once they have, then the second part of their task is going to be rearrange these items in new categories and make it a little tougher than the ones they left you because they're going to have to come back and figure out how you did that. Okay, so one person will be the consistent and stay at the table. So this is the way the routine is going to go. We're just going to do around the room. So you're here, you're here, you're here, you go next door, next door, come up this way, come up this way, you guys go here, and they'll go here. So you got that? Okay. I'll tell you when to move the next time. So you're going here. And, and you're coming here. Okay. Did you find it more difficult when you had to take somebody's, you know, a, a stuff and do a different way? And if we did two more rounds, how much more difficult would it get? All of a sudden, you would have to start thinking outside the box. Like, can you do it by color? Can you do it by first part of the alphabet, middle of the alphabet, end of the alphabet? Trust me, that's a hard one to guess. Or texture. Or, you know, shiny, not shiny, and, you know, cloth, you know, products that, where it came from. It, you can just keep, continue to think of different ways to sort the same material. And what you do with the kids is teach them there are lots of different ways to organize stuff. As long as you know how it makes sense, and it makes sense to you, it's not a problem. So what you need to do with kids is organize things lots of different ways and then ask them which way seems to suit you best as opposed to everybody needs to do folders or as opposed to everybody needs to do tabs. That a lot of times when they create the organization, they're lots more likely to stick with it. Now, I wouldn't have them, you know, if they're little kids, maybe I'd give them two choices. You could do it this way or this way. And if you can think of a better way, tell me about it and we'll talk. And as long as it works for you, I'm good with it. Study alone or with a partner. One of the um, authors at ASCD that, that I work with sometimes is named Judy Willis. She is blooming amazing. And she is a neurologist by trade, 
but she has taken a job of teaching one class in a middle school, a math class in the morning, before she goes to work. Because she was getting really annoyed with teachers with everybody, you know, this kid's ADD, this kid's ADHD, and all these diagnoses were coming from the teachers. And it's kind of like when the doctor says, this kid needs an IEP, and you're going, mm -hmm, thank you. <laughs> and, you know, you're kind of out of your field here. And so she, she was saying, I need to see what they're seeing because I am not seeing it. And when she started teaching, she said, okay, I get it. They're still not ADHD, but the, I get it. And so what she did with the kids is this. She's, she's the only teacher in the school who got 100% of her homework day after day after day. And the way she did it was she gave them eight minutes of homework every night. And she said to them, okay, today I want you to do your homework in your bedroom without any television, any music, any phone. Eight minutes, you have to stop after eight minutes though because you'll mess up the research project. And then next week, we're gonna do it in the living room or wherever your television is and your television has to be on. And the next week, it would be with the radio on. And the next week, it would be eight minutes but you have to text two people during the process. And so they she would change one variable every week and the kids couldn't wait to come in the next morning and take the test on whatever the homework was and see how well they had done. And they would chart it and say, okay, can, are you better at doing it in front of the television or when you're texting or when you're listening to music or when you're alone or when you're with a partner? Do you need a quiet space? Do you not need a quiet space? And kids began to see the patterns of their own learning, but they also began to chart the group as a whole. And the, even though most kids might be able to do X, you might not be able to. And do you understand how clever that is? <laughs> and it's a way to organize, okay, this works for you, but it doesn't work for me kind of a thinking. And so <clears throat> here's the last task. At your table, think about all the things that we've done today, strategies and thoughts, and I missed a couple. What is the most important learning you had today? Ready, go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Is there anything you need to say before we dismiss? Oh, my pleasure. So I'll, we'll start this again tomorrow, and it'll be new topics, but just as intense. <laughs> Thank you.